So welcome everybody. Um, without any waste of time, let me just jump into it and introduce our guest of honor today, Emeritus Professor Mike Bruton. Uh, he's a retired aquatic scientist. He is best known for his research and con conservation uh, of the living collecant. Uh, Prof. Bruton was first head of education at the Two Oceans Aquarium in, in Cape Town. Uh, he also established the MTN Science Center, which is now called the Cape Town Science Center. Uh, Prof. now spends his time in Cape Town writing science books, uh, giving talks, hiking, cycling, uh, tending his eco pool, <laughs> beehives, and uh, compost him. Uh, he has traveled widely, both above and underwater, seeking out the strangest animals. And this particular presentation is exactly about that. So um, without any waste of time, ladies and gentlemen, remember during the presentation, if you've got any questions, please leave them on the Q&A um, on that comment. Comment anything that you'd like Prof to touch at the end of the talk and we'll address it at the end. Without any waste of time, Prof, over to you and to everybody else. I will see you guys on the other side of the call. Prof, over to you. Right, thank you very much, John, for that introduction. And it's wonderful to be part of your Kirsten Bush, Bosch community again. My talk today is about which is our strangest animal. And as you know, um, humans tend to be fascinated by superlatives. So we're going to do a sort of romp through the animal kingdom and along the way, try to identify uh, our strangest animal. Now, obviously, this is, uh, uh, this is kind of information in this talk comes from this book of mine called Curious Notions, Reflections of an Imagineer, which is a series of essays on topics uh, that interest me in science and in which I've been involved. And there you can see a quick review of the chapters. There are two chapters on the funny side of science, which include some of the colorful characters in the history of science, creativity in the arts and science, about the Lunar Society and the Owl Club, the evolution of the bicycle, a challenging one on who is South Africa's greatest inventor, uh, the comical art of naming new species, a chapter about words ending in ology, two chapters on the coelacan story, one on the dodo, and then two on which is South Africa's strangest animal, and finally on our African Nobel laureate. But we're going to be focusing on the strangest animal. Now, this is quite a challenging task because how does one compare a mosquito with a blue whale or nudibranch uh, with a flamingo? Each of them is obviously an extraordinary endpoint in evolution and a survivor that has found unique solutions to the challenges posed by evolution. So all of them are extraordinary and strange animals. But let's define strange. Basically, it means out of the ordinary, often defined by the lack of a body organ or a particular function, uh, being unfamiliar to, to us. Uh, it differs from the normal bow plan, uh, the building plan for that group of animals, and has, uh, may have aberrant behavior and lifestyle. So if we look on, at variations on the typical mammalian bow plan, if we take a dog as a typical mammal with four legs, a tail, and ears and head, look at the extraordinary range of, of um, mammalian forms that have been created through evolution, the bat, the pangolin, um, the hippopotamus and the whales. Now, what I'm not including in this analysis is uh, the animals that we have domesticated, even though some of them are quite extraordinary. I'm also not including our own species, Homo sapiens, which is supposed to mean wise human, but being on the brink of a third world war, one could argue that we're probably the stupidest animal on the planet. I'm also not including microorganisms such as the COVID-19 virus. Now, if one looks elsewhere in the world, there really are some extraordinary animals like the duckbill platypus, the blobfish, the giraffe neck beetle and the eye eye. But I think you'll find as we go through my, my talk that we have some of the strangest animals in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Firstly, let's start with one of the most primitive uh, group of animals, the sponges. And these are animals that lack internal organs. They have no nervous system. 
They do have spicules in their tissues to provide rigidity, and they have an internet, uh, in, intricate network of pores, hence their name, porifera, which means poor animals. And they have turrets through water, which water is drawn, and they absorb oxygen and food um, from that water. Moving on to the salenterates, these include the sea anemones, sea fans, uh, sea pens, corals, and jellyfish. Um, they, as you can see with the sea anemone on the left, they have a simple sac-like body with tentacles encircling the mouth. They have st stinging cells called nematocysts, which are remarkable cells. And it, it, you know, it, it's very puzzling how such a remarkable specialized cell could develop in such a simple animal. Most uh, salenterates are attached, um, at least as adults. Some can uh, evert their stomachs and some of them are colonial. And they depend on the buoyancy of seawater uh, to retain their shape and could not live on land. Um, so one group of uh, salenterates uh, that is colonial are the uh, zoanthids uh, shown here. And then we also have the hard corals, which comprise multiple anemone-like polyps that produce hard limestone skeletons. And these hard corals are commensal with single-celled algae called zooxanthellae that absorb nitrogen from the coral, provide the coral with food, and help them to build the skeleton. Now, this symbiosis with zooxanthellae limits the hard corals to the sunlit warm waters and they are therefore vulnerable to any changes in climate, uh, which changes the penetration of um, sunlight into the sea. And our mushroom coral top uh, right is unusual in that it is a solitary coral and is able to move. Now, just a comment, a general comment on intertidal animals. I've always regarded the intertidal pool as the best classroom, the best biological classroom in the world. It teaches us not only about the extraordinary diversity of plants and animals, but also about the differences between plants, I mean, between animals in the sea and on land. Many animals in the sea are sessile. In other words, they stay in one place, more or less, as adults. Whereas many plants in the sea, such as the free flight floating phytoplankton, are constantly moving. And this, of course, is in contrast to the situation on land, where animals move and plants are sessile. Many marine animals um, resemble plants and are attached as adults, especially in the high um, energy intertidal zone shown here, unlike animals on land. And humans are often puzzled by the fantastical adaptations of intertidal animals to the twice daily ebb and flow of the tides and wave action. We also marvel at the ability of stationary predators to catch moving prey. And the fact that many marine animals have one, two, three, five or more legs, anything but four. So let's move on to the next group, which are the uh, jellyfish. Uh, these are surreal bell-shaped animals with a circular body. And despite their simplicity, they have light sensitive organs and they're carnivores that stun their prey with those unique little nematocysts. Blue bottles are colonies of individuals uh, with each individual specialized for a, sp a specific task, such as catching prey, defense, eating and ingesting food, breeding, or producing the float, which contains nitrogen and carbon monoxide to keep the animal afloat. And then on the top left, you can see a relative of the blue bottle, the by the wind sailor, um, which have left and right, right handed shaped floats, uh, which uh, help them to move across the ocean surface. Now let's move on to another group of animals, the annelids, a representative I've chosen is the earthworm. Uh, they are, these are soft, unsegmented worms, and some of the largest ones in the world are found in South Africa, near Debbie Neck and the Eastern Cape. The earthworms up to three meters long. Now we move on to a very remarkable animal, uh, the velvet worm or peripetus, uh, which is so unique that it belongs to its own phylum, the Arnicophora or claw bearers. And it's the only animal phylum that is entirely confined to land. 
And for instance, the only animal phylum is consigned fine to the sea is the echinoderms. Um, the velvet worms have a distant marine ancestor and they are genuine living fossils that almost exactly resemble 550 million year old fossils of the group. They secretive worms that live in forest litter. They have 13 to 25 pairs of stumpy legs. And like some marine animals, they secrete slime to ensnare their prey and for defense. They are regarded as intermediate between the jointed legged animals, the arthropods, which we'll come to now, and the segmented worms, in that they have jointed legs, compound eyes, and breathing tubes like insects, but a worm like body and non chitinous um, skin and kidneys in each segment like worms. The South African species um, are all live bearers, which is unusual for a worm like animal and they breathe through their skin. Let's move on to the wheel animacule, the rotifer. Now, interestingly, nature hasn't invented the wheel in any form. There is no biological device for connecting nerve endings to a spinning disc, like commutators in an electric motor. But wheel animacules probably come closest to this as they have a crown of cilia that moves in a circular sequence but does not actually rotate. Uh, and wheel animacules, like many other microscopic animals, have a fixed number of cells, about 1,000. And their eggs and even adult females can survive desiccation for years or even decades, similar to uh, brine shrimp eggs, some frog eggs, killifish eggs, and lungfish in cartoons. Right, let's move on to the giant group of the arthropods or the jointed footed animals. They characterize by having segmented bodies, jointed limbs, a chitin exoskeleton, and they include millipedes, centipedes, spiders, scorpions, and the insects. Here's an example, the millipede or songololo, which means to roll up. Um, and we have a giant one um, in South Africa, the um, giant African millipede, which reaches over 33 centimeters long. They secrete an irritating liquid uh, to deter predators, and not even driver ants can eat them. They don't have a thousand legs, they have about 256 legs, but the number does vary. Spiders are another group of arthropods, they're air breathing, they have eight legs, and they're able to inject venom into their prey. Most of the limb on land, but there are a few on the seashore. Um, and the spiders and many of the other animals that I'll portray, uh, one must remember it's not just their morphology, their structure that makes them strange. It's their lifestyles and their feeding and breeding habits. Here's the shore spider and you can see it has huge poison fangs and they're in the habit of trapping air bubbles in silk lined crevices in intertidal pools. And they shelter there uh, at high tide and then emerge at low tide uh, to feed. And here's a, speeder, uh, a spider that I often came across in my research on the lakes and uh, lagoons of northern Zululand. It's a rare example of an invertebrate that feeds on vertebrate, the fish eating spider. Uh, it, it sort of hovers just uh, above or below the water surface and pounces on fishes and the aquatic stages of, of insects uh, which it eats. Now moving on to the insects, a massive group uh, characterized by having six legs, a body in three parts, and many of them with a full metamorphosis. Uh, here's an uh, unusual example of uh, one of our two marine species of insects, the other being the kelp fly. Uh, the marine springtail uh, shelters in air pockets underwater and scavengers um, at low tide in a similar way to the shore spider. Now we're all familiar with the praying mantis, but that doesn't mean it's not a remarkable animal. It has a pair of raptorial forelegs, a triangular uh, head, uh, binocular vision, and they are solitary ambush predators that have earring organs on their legs to detect bats and other predators. And remarkably, the females feed off the male's head while they are mating. Another familiar animal, which is equally remarkable, the butterflies, in this example, the swallowtail. 
Uh, they have a very distinct metamorphosis from an egg to a caterpillar, to a pupa, to an imago um, or adult. And uh, butterflies, as you know, undertake extensive migrations and are very important pollinators. And here are a few other examples of insect larvae that look totally different from the adult. And of course, they also live in a different habitat, they eat different food, and they um, have different predators. From an ecological point of view, they are therefore effectively different ecological species. Now, the honeybee is quite an extraordinary animal, a social animal, extremely industrious, with intricate social lives and a division of labor. They have workers, foragers, nurses, and the queen bee. And interestingly, our Cape honeybee, uh, the queen can develop from a specially fed worker bee, which is not the case uh, for some other honeybee species. I fortunately have a um, Cape honeybee hive in my garden, and it's an endless source of uh, pleasure and inspiration to me. Honeybees have five eyes, including two compound eyes with over 7,000 lenses. They also have a long proboscis to suck up nectar and, of course, collect pollen. And uh, these are used to make food and honey in the hive. The queen lays one egg in each cell in the honeycomb. Let's move on to the next large group of arthropods, um, or jointed legged animals, and this is the crustacea. They are arthropods with 10 legs and a carapace or shell. An example here is the hermit crab, which lives in the shells of an animal from a completely different phylum, the mollusk. So as it grows up, it has to find progressively larger uh, mollusk shells. And many hermit crabs form symbiotic relationships with other animals, also in different phyla, such as anemones and sponges. And our decorator crab is in the habit of placing seaweed fragments over its shell to camouflage it, and then actually changes color to match the color of the seaweed, uh, seaweed fragments. Here's an unusual crab, which doesn't, like most crabs, live on the sea bottom, uh, but actually lives near the ocean surface. And yet another remarkable crustacean, the mantis shrimp, which has a pair of um, enormous sickle-like uh, front limbs, similar to those of the praying mantis. And the strike then they, that they can exert with the heel of this limb has a force approaching that of a low caliber bullet and can crack the glass of an aquarium. They have sophisticated trinocular vision and better color reception uh, than uh, humans. And he has an even more remarkable uh, crustacean, the tongue replacement isopod. Okay, it's, it's a, um, a isopod, uh, it's a kind of crustacean, and this one has actually eaten away the tongue of this living fish and replaced the tongue and spends the rest of its life in the mouth of the fish, gobbling up uh, fragments of food. Goose barnacles um, are crustaceans, although they look a bit like uh, mollusks. They highly specialize. They have minute planktonic larva, and the adults are sedentary with a hard shell. And they typically attach to rocks, logs, ship's hulls, and even to crabs and whales. Moving on to um, moss animals. Um, these are the bryozoa, and they exist in so many different forms that they resemble um, other um, marine animals, such as anemones, sea fans, sponges, hydroids, corals, uh, fan worms, and even seaweeds. So, you know, if you go to the intertidal zone and there's an animal that you can't identify, if you call it a moss animal, you're likely to be right. They consist of colonies of tiny individuals called zooids. Uh, each enclosed in a minute skeleton and crowned with filter-feeding tentacles. Let's move on to the mollusks. These are unsegmented animals, soft-bodied, uh, with a rasping tongue and large muscular foot. And many of them have shells, and many of them are carnivorous. And some have eight to ten long tentacles. This is the example of the largest uh, of our mollusks, the giant clam. Um, it's a filter feeder that also farms microscopic algae. And these uh, giant clams can grow to centuries old. And in fact, some of them have been aged 
by determining the um, traces of radioactive fallout from nuclear explosions that occurred um, in the past uh, in the ocean. Another interesting mollusk is the chitin, which is flattened and has eight overlapping plates and the end plate resembling a human's false teeth. And like other mollusks, they rasp their food off rocks. And chitazan, which is extracted from South African chitons, shows promise for cancer treatment. A remarkable mollusk that has lost its shell are the nudibranchs. And they've compensated for their loss of their shell by secreting toxic chemicals and using flamboyant colors to warn predators about their toxicity. Uh, the Spanish dancer is a nudibranch that could have been invented by an abstract artist. And their balletic movements belie the fact that they are voracious predators on sponges, moss animals, and hydroids. Some nudibranchs are plant suckers that pierce the walls of algae and suck out the nutrients from their tissues, including the chloroplasts, which are green, chlorophyll containing organelles that carry out photosynthesis. And remarkably, these chloroplasts continue the process of converting light energy into food inside the mollusk and color it green, an envial adaptation that land animals have failed to emulate. He has a remark, another remarkable um, mollusk, a sea swallow. It's a sort of serialistic beast that resembles a blue bottle more than a mollusk, floats upside down on the sea surface, gulping air bubbles to keep it afloat, and can reuse stinging cells, nematocysts of its prey, which include jellyfish, to defend itself. Imagine a predator on land acquiring the defensive mechanisms of its prey after lunch. Then we move on to the cephalopods, uh, very advanced um, mollusks. Their name cephalopod means merged head foot, and they include the octopus, the squid, cuttlefish, and nautilus. They're all marine, and they the most radically different mollusks. Uh, they have a large head, very well-developed eyes, a muscular mantle, a siphon that propels them backwards using uh, powerful jets of water, and elongate prehensile arms covered with two rows of suckers. They have blue blood and seven hearts, and the squids are the largest mollusks, reaching 20 plus meters. And here's the octopus, which has become so familiar uh, to us through Craig Foster's remarkable film. Um, they're probably the most intelligent in, of the invertebrates, and some activists um, believe that they deserve to have animal rights uh, like backboned animals uh, have. Octopus guard their eggs, which match, hatch into miniature octopuses with no larval or planktonic stage. They grow very rapidly, to, uh, reaching six kilograms in a year. And our southern giant octopus has tentacles reaching three meters long. Um, they can change color, as we well know, and they exhibit an extraordinary range of tactics to catch prey, avoid predators, and escape from aquaria. The paper nautilus is a, a midwater octopus. Uh, the males are minute, um, um, shellless, and planktonic, and the female produces a large, delicate shell that serves as a brood chamber for the eggs. A typical shelled mollusk is the cone shell, uh, which has a hollow harpoon-like teeth through which they're able to inject potent neurotoxic poisons. And two species in South Africa, the textile cone and the geographic cone are potentially lethal to humans. Right, let's change gear completely and move into the echinoderms, um, the most radically different um, group of invertebrates. Uh, echinoderms mean spiny skin, and they include the starfishes, basket stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, and feather stars. What makes them unique is that they are five rayed or pentaradial, which differs completely from the laterally symmetrical boplan of most animals. But interestingly, the larvae of echinoderms are symmetrical, like other animals. The adults typically have a calcareous skeleton, 
uh, but this is absent in feather stars and sea cucumbers. And they have a central disc with a mouth facing downwards and an anus upwards. They have tube feet along their arms that operate using water pressure, and they can regenerate lost arms and organs, and can, some species can even regenerate their body from a tentacle. The example shown here is a brittle star, which remarkably can react to light, even though it has no eyes or brain. And when attacked, they are able to release an arm, which emits a flashing light to distract predators. Next example is a feather star, another echinoderm. They have tiny round bodies uh, with hook-like limbs and a crown of feather-like growths that they use to catch food. They usually attach to rock or coral, but they are able to move and even swim slowly. The sea urchin, they've wrapped their five arms together to form a spherical protective test. And our Cape sea urchin typically uses dead snail shells as a sunshade. And here's another echinoderm, the sea cucumber, which is the most atypical of them. Its five rayed pattern has been simplified into a sausage-like shape resembling a cucumber, uh, but they have five rows of tube feet along the body, which betrays their identity as echinoderms. Our golden sea cucumber hosts a small pearl fish that lives permanently inside its intestines. Uh, sea cucumbers can expel the internal organs and regrow them, and our snake sea cucumber can eject long sticky threads to distract predators, similar to the behavior of velvet worms. Right, so the echinoderms really are a totally different group from the other uh, invertebrates. And there I've summarized some of the, the strangest uh, invertebrates that we've discussed so far, uh, the sea spin, uh, pen, the sea swallow, the velvet worm, and so on, uh, you're now familiar with them. Let's move on to the next major group, which is the chordates, to which we belong. The chordates have a dorsal nerve cord, slits in the throat for breathing, and a tail behind the anus, at least in their juvenile stages. And even human embryos at five weeks have gill slits and tails. And the chordates include red bait, sea squirts, and the familiar backboned animals. So this is a sea squirt, which as you can see is a sort of featureless sack-like marine animal, more, looks more like a salenterate than an advanced animal. Their larvae are tadpole-like with a dorsal nerve cord and tail, which gives them away as a, a chordate. They have purple blood in contrast to the blue blood of octopuses and spiders and the green blood of various marine worms. And humans are more closely related to sea squirts, although they have no muscles or nerve cells, than to jellyfish, which have elaborate, elaborate sense organs, as well as nerve and muscle cells. Now let's move on to the vertebrates, a major group of the chordates. And these include the familiar fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, as well as us. And all of them have a cartilaginous or bony backbone. Fishes, uh, are the most diverse uh, group of vertebrates. They typically live in water, have fins, uh, breathe underwater using gills, are cold-blooded, have scales or scutes, or maybe scaleless, and have no neck, and there are at least 34,000 living species. Uh, the first example I've shown here is the hagfish, uh, which is a jawless fish related to the lampreys. Uh, they have no jaws, but they have protrusible teeth embedded in the flesh of their mouth. And the best place uh, to see um, hagfish um, is at Smitswinkel Bay. Um, we have the six gill hagfish, which is an eel like parasitic fish, uh, which has no paired fins and they secrete sticky slime. They've remained virtually unaltered for 300 million years now unbelievably prehistoric creatures that have remained competitive in the modern cutthroat world. Moving on to the cartilaginous fishes, here's a bizarre example, the large-tailed sawfish, uh, which is a specialized ray and has rows of teeth on a long rostrum like a saw. 
a manta ray, a spectacular animal to see underwater. They are huge rays which reach a width of seven meters. They have triangular pectoral fins, horn-shaped cephalic fins, and large forward-facing mouth. They have one of the largest brains of any fish, weighing 200 grams, 10 times larger than the brain of a whale shark, and the largest brain to mass ratio of any fish. Move on to the whale sharks. I've had the pleasure of diving off them, with them off Mozambique. Uh, they are the largest fish, reaching nearly 19 meters. They are slow moving, filter feeding, and harmless to humans. He has a very unusual cartilaginous fish, the six gill stingray. And it was unknown until relatively recently when a journalist, Dave Bickle, found one washed up on a beach in Port Elizabeth and took it to the Ichthyology Institute in Grahamstown, uh, where the scientists described it as hexatrigon bicoli. Has a fleshy snout and uniquely six pairs of gill slits in contrast to the five pairs of gill slits found in all other skates and rays. It therefore had to be placed in a new suborder of fishes, which is equivalent to finding the first representative of all the monkeys and apes. Let's move on to the next group of fishes, the lobe fins, which include the coelacanths and lungfishes. And they are most closely related to the first backboned animals that ventured onto land from the sea about 320 million years ago. The African uh, coelacant shown here um, has an amazing potpourri of characters. Like a bony fish, they have scales, a bony head and bony fin supports. They have a lateral line and fins with spines and rays. But like cartilaginous fish, they have a cartilaginous notochord, a heart organs in a straight line, a spiral valve, and a rectal gland, and they retain urea in their tissues like sharks. Their lineage goes back at least 420 million years, and they uniquely have three lobes in the tail fin and can lift their upper jaw. They also uniquely have the lowest hemoglobin count of any vertebrate, the slowest metabolic rate, the most advanced breeding strategy of any fish, the largest eggs the size of a grapefruit, the longest pregnancy or gestation period of any animal, a phenomenal five years or 60 months, and they swim in a unique way with eight fins. The other lobe fin fish is the lungfish. I've always felt rather sorry for the lungfish. It's, it's an extraordinary animal that's attracted very little attention, except among specialist ichthyologists. Uh, they have lungs and can survive desiccation in a cocoon. Uh, their fins are long and thread-like. They also have a long lineage dating back 416 million years. And they were the first animals to evolve a single bone in the upper limb and a double bone in the lower limb, like humans, and multi-boned wrists and ankles. And they guard eggs um, in a nest. Here are some other unusual fishes, a remora, which attaches itself to other large fishes, the mud skipper, which is able to hop around uh, on the mud of mangrove swamps, uh, breathe air, and even climb trees. The transparent leptocephalus eel larva of our freshwater eels, and the squeaker uh, or up to, upside down catfish, uh, which swims upside down the water surface in our wetland. The seahorse is a remarkable fish, which like the pipefish, broods its eggs in pouch a pouch on the male's belly, and they swim upright using the dorsal fin uh, for propulsion. An extraordinary fish that is often seen off Cape Town, lives in the open ocean near the water surface, is the ocean sunfish. Um, and remarkably, they produce over 2 million eggs per spawning. This is in contrast, for instance, to the coelacanth, which typically produces just a few dozen eggs. Right, let's move on to the next group of vertebrates, and these are the frogs or amphibians. Um, they are cold-blooded, four-legged. They have a soft skin with no scales, fur, or feathers. And they typically have a metamorphosis with a tadpole aquatic stage. And the adults usually hop around on powerful back legs. 
They found on land and in fresh waters, but not in the sea. Uh, the bullfrog shown here is our largest frog, reach, reaching a length of 11 centimeters. And the males show remarkable uh, parental care of the young. They guard their tadpoles, they chase away predators, and they may even dig channels to deeper water to save the tadpoles from desiccation. Uh, here's my famous, um, uh, my favorite amphibian, the clawed frog. And I have a colony of them living in the eco pool in my back garden. So I spend a lot of time watching their behavior. They're aquatic swimming frogs, air breathers when they're active. Um, and they have three claws on their hind feet with which they tear prey apart. They're perhaps most famous for the fact that they were used in a very accurate pregnancy test uh, between the 1940s and the 1970s. And over 400,000 clawed toads were bred in South Africa, mainly at Jonkershoek in Stellenbosch, and exported around the world. Um, and inevitably, they escaped or were released from laboratories in other countries, and they're now found in over 48 countries, the most widespread frog in the world. They're also the only frog that's been into space because they were taken up um, on the space shuttle Endeavour in 1992 uh, to do experiments to determine whether they could breed at near uh, zero gravity. And the, the hardy frogs didn't miss a beat. Right, let's move on to reptiles, another group of vertebrates, uh, a chameleon, very familiar with us, to us with its long sticky tongue, the amphisbenian, which is a legless lizard, the deadly gaboon adder, which has the largest venomous glands of any snake. And on the bottom right, Bhutan snake-eyed skink, uh, which is a remarkable lizard that lives in Black Rock in uh, Isimangalisa Wetland Park in Zululand and forages in intertidal pools. Um, the sea snake is arguably the most completely aquatic of all air-breathing vertebrates. They're related to cobras and mumbas and are very venomous. Uh, they feed on fishes and give birth to baby snakes in the open ocean. They are air breathers and have one large elongate lung, but they can also absorb about 20% of their oxygen needs from the water uh, through their skin. And as you can see, they have a flattened paddle-like paddle tail, uh, which is used for propulsion. They have a nasal gland for purging salt and valved nostrils to keep water out of their lungs. Loggerhead, uh, sorry, leatherback turtles are the second largest uh, reptiles after crocodilians. Uh, they breed and nest um, off our uh, Zululand coast. And we tend to take them for granted, but they are extraordinary animals, the long ancestry and uh, beautiful uh, to see in the sea. They reach a length of three meters and 900 kilograms and they lay eggs in nests on the beach in which they were originally hatched themselves. The crocodiles are um, direct descendants of the dinosaurs. They are effectively living dinosaurs. And despite their predatory nature, they are, have advanced maternal care behavior. I have personally witnessed at Lake Sabai in Zululand, a crocodile digging up a nest, helping the eggs to hatch, and then taking the, the young crocodiles away, uh, resting on her head or back uh, in order to protect them during their first few days of existence. And they're able to stay underwater for up to an hour when they're not active. Right, move on to the next group of vertebrates, which are the birds. Um, they're warm-blooded like mammals. They fly, run or swim. Uh, they have a high metabolic rate and an elevated body temperature. Uh, they have feathers, uh, their mouths have no teeth, but they have beaked jaws, and they lay hard-shelled eggs. And unlike the fishes, amphibians, um, reptiles, and mammals, there are no representatives of the birds that are live bearers. They all lay hard-shelled eggs. They have a four-chambered heart and a light but strong skeleton. The first example here is the ostrich, uh, the largest bird in Africa, 2.8 meters tall. Of course, it's flightless, but they can run up to uh, speed up to 70 kilometers an hour with a stride of over five meters. 
They nest communally and share egg and young guarding duties. And they are related to the giant flightless elephant birds of Madagascar and the mowers of New Zealand. Secretary bird on the right, an unusual combination of an eagle-like body and crane-like legs. They perform elaborate courtship displays, build large nests, and unlike most birds of prey, they hunt in pairs on the ground, stamping their prey, such as snakes, to death. It's a species that is endangered and it appears on the South African coat of arms. Here are some other unusual birds, the pelican with their long beak and their huge throat patch. They live canoni and they hunt cooperatively. Uh, penguins, which have a remarkable bipedal gait. Uh, kingfishers, which dive um, from dizzy heights to catch fish. And the skimmer, which skims water, uh, skims food from the new stun. Now the owls are remarkably adapted birds. This example, the spotted eagle owl, you can see its huge forward facing eyes. It has acute binocular vision. They can swivel their heads through 270 degrees and have acute hearing. Their hollow faces reflect sound into their ears and they can hunt in total darkness. And you may have seen owls bobbing their heads up and down and they do this to obtain a clear 3D image. Social weaver is an unremarkable looking bird, but it builds an amazing nest, huge permanent community nests, probably the most spectacular structures built by any bird. And these nests can be over a hundred years old and the nest is able to maintain stable air temperatures and often provides habitat for other animals. Then finally, let's move on to the mammals, the last group of vertebrates, and um, they are warm-blooded. Uh, they usually give birth to live young, although there are two examples elsewhere in the world uh, that lay eggs. They have mammary glands and females that feed milk to the young. They have fur or hair, uh, three bones in the middle ear, and a neocortex for higher brain functions usually walk or run, but can also hop, swim, fly, burrow, or climb. Uh, sorry, the bats are um, remarkably adapted mammals. Uh, they're the only mammals capable of true uh, sustained flight. Uh, their front legs have been developed into membranous wings. They have a, an acute sense of hearing and are able to produce ultrasonic sounds to detect their prey. They're also able to detect the magnetic field of the Earth in order to determine direction, altitude, and location, as is also the case uh, in homing pigeons, eels, uh, turtles, and mole rats. Another remarkable mammal is the pangolin or scaly anteater. It's a, basically a mammal with no fur in reptiles' clothing. They're covered with an armor of overlapping scales, different from those of reptiles, that extend over the body and down the legs to the feet. And they typically roll up in a tight ball when attacked. The sharp edged scales also used for defense and they're able to release a foul smelling liquid like skunks. Their toothed mouth has been replaced by a tapering toothless snout and chewing is carried out using ingested stones in a muscular gizzard. Uh, as in some birds. They also have a stomach lined with keratinous spikes. They have a sticky 40 centimeter long tongue, which they use to collect ants and termites that they've dug out of mounds with their sharp claws. They give birth to one young at a time, which they protect within their coils or carry on their backs. They are nocturnal and solitary and very rarely seen. Sadly, they're one of the most trafficked land animals and are rated as vulnerable to extinction. The giraffe, their scientific name, Giraffa camillo fardalis, means as large as a camel and as spotted as a leopard. They're the tallest animals at 5.8 meters, but have the same number of neck bones as humans, seven, but each bone is 25 centimeters long. They have a very long gestation period of 15 months, and the young weigh 100 kilograms at birth. They have a circulatory system that defies gravity, driven by a powerful heart 
that weighs 10 kilograms compared to the human heart of about 345 grams. The African elephant, largest terrestrial vertebrate reaching six tons in males. They have pillar-like legs, an elongate nose in the form of a trunk, which is a kind of multi-tool for breathing, smelling, trumpeting, drinking, washing, and even for use as a snorkel when crossing deep rivers. They have huge ears uh, for hearing and also uh, to radiate excess heat. They have a thick skin and a large brain with a well-developed neocortex and are among the most intelligent of animals that exhibit many forms of smart behavior, such as grief, learning, mimicry, play, a sense of humor, altruism, altruism, um, use of toils, compassion, cooperation, and possibly language. And here's the familiar hippo, whose name means river horse. Um, as you know, they come out of the water to graze on land uh, when it's cooler at night, and they spend their day in water where the buoyancy helps to support their weight. And occasionally they are known to leave rivers and go down the estuaries out into sea. And we once tracked one that uh, swam in the sea uh, for over 40 kilometers north of uh, the St. Lucia estuary. They are highly dangerous animals that kill more people than crocodiles. Now, the elephant seal is not a typical South African animal, it's an Antarctic animal. But I did finally, uh, manage to photograph one that made a surprise visit to Jessa Point in Zululand in 1977. And then finally, among the males, uh, mammals, let's look at the cetaceans. Uh, they are dramatic exceptions from the mammalian uh, bow plan, well adapted for aquatic life. They've lost their hind limbs and their forelimbs are modified into flippers for steering and stability and the horizontal tail flukes provide propulsion. The whales communicate using intricate songs and the dolphins using buzzes, clicks and whistles. And they're all air breathers, but mates give birth and suckle their young at sea. Now the dolphin shown here is a small toothed whale, beautifully adapted for marine life, highly intelligent and very social. The killer whale or orca is the largest marine predator, uh, if we exclude the planktivores, um, reaching eight meters and eight tons. They carry out elaborate social hunting and are known to slide out of the sea to catch seals on land on Marion Island. And they live in all the oceans and seas of the world and are the most widespread mammal. The southern right whale, uh, we're familiar with it, that, but that doesn't mean it isn't extraordinary. It's a baleen whale, which was heavily hunted before, with about 130,000 killed between 1770 and 1850, reducing their numbers to only 300 individuals. But fortunately, under protection, they have recovered spectacularly. Um, and then finally, the blue whale, which is the largest animal that's ever lived, as far as we know, reaching 33 meters and 175 tons. And physiologists and morphologists have actually calculated that it's the largest animal that could exist. They were also heavily hunted, but have recovered um, under protection. They have a pregnancy of 11 months. And at the end of the six month weaning period, after the mother has been feeding uh, the young, they have already reached 16 meters and 23 tons. Sadly, today, we hear blue whales more often than we see them and a new population was recently found off the northeast coast of Africa uh, by recording their songs. Right, so let's uh, review where we are at. These are the invertebrates that I selected for uh, as among the strangest of that group of animals. These are the vertebrates that I selected, um, some very weird examples among them. So if we then take it down to what we could call the quarterfinals, and I, I select the last eight among all the invertebrates um, and, and the vertebrates. And there you can see the sea urchin, the uh, velvet worm, the octopus, the coelacanth, the sea snake, 
uh, bat, pangolin, and elephant. So those are the last eight. But if we then, we've got to make decisions and we then take it to the semi-finals to the last four, here they are, my selection anyway, uh, the velvet worm, the coelacanth, uh, the pangolin and the bat. Now we're going to do something very interesting with the help of Belinda. We're actually going to take a poll uh, from you and we're going to ask each of you to vote as to which you regard as the strangest animal. So please, as soon as possible, uh, put a, a tick or a dot uh, on the form for voting and we'll shortly uh, communicate the result to you. Please go ahead with your voting. Well, it's remarkable. The results have come in, and there's almost a dead heat between the velvet worm and the coelacanth. Velvet worm receiving 33% of the vote, coelacanth 32%, and followed very closely by the pangolin, 29%, and the bat at 6%. So thank you very much for casting your vote so quickly and efficiently. And there we have the results with the pang a velvet worm, in your opinion, edging out the coelacanth, uh, followed closely by the pangolin and the bat in a distant uh, fourth place. Right, now I want to reveal to you what I wrote in my book um, about um, the uh, finalists. Um, right, I actually pinned down the, um, the last two to Peripetus and uh, or the Velvet Worm and the Pangolin. And that's pretty similar to your vote. Uh, you gave the velvet room 33% and the pangolin 29%. And then having carefully considered those two options, I voted for the pangolin as being the winner as our strangest animal. But I must admit to you that since I published that book, I've had second thoughts about my choice. And um, I must say the velvet worm um, has a very good case to be our strangest animal. Right, I'm out the end with just a few slides that comment on strangeness and ask the question, why would animals be strange? Why would they differ from the norm? And there's several reasons I've come up with. Some of them are sort of frozen in evolutionary time. Uh, they found a morphology and a uh, behavior that is adaptive and they haven't needed to change. Others have developed novel feeding methods or acquired special powers. Some have developed advanced breeding modes, which makes them different, or an unusual combination of traits like the velvet worm and the coelacanth. Some have adapted to live in unusual environments, adapted to new biomes, or adopted novel lifestyles. Now, something striking that came across, uh, you know, I realized when I was doing this review, is how many animals um, have uh, properties and qualities that humans don't uh, have even though we regard them as lower animals. And some of these properties include sight without eyes, ner nerve coordination without brains, production of ultrasonic sounds and also echoes, uh, flight, electroreception, magnetoreception, trinocular vision and better color vision than humans, the ability, for instance, in bees to produce electrostatic charges to gather pollen, the regrowth of organs, which we can't do, the external digestion, the capture of chloroplasts and nematocysts, which continue operating in the predator and light production. Just a few examples. And finally, I'd like to mention that sadly, many of the strange animals that I've identified in the survey are threatened with extinction for several reasons. 
Uh, for instance, some of them are highly specialized, they're high in the food pyramid, uh, and therefore um, any extinctions or uh, depletions go on lower down the food pyramid, make them vulnerable. They're often partners in dependencies such as symbiotic or commensal relationships. They live in complex communities which can easily be disrupted. Some of them are rare. Some of them like uh, uh, the river and rabbit, which I didn't mention, but which is also a candidate have narrow habitat preferences. And some of them have a high parental investment in a few young. So that's the book in which the two chapters on this topic uh, is discussed. If you're interested to read further, please get the book. And I'd like to thank you very much. And now hand over to John and Belinda, who are gonna tell you more about the books that I've published through Penguin Random House and Astray. Thank you. You've taken us on a journey. It's like um, when I look at some of the, the, you know, the animals you've spoken about, you've talked about, it's, it, it's like I'm looking at a cartoon drawing of some sort. <laughs> it's like a, a wonder world, you know, um, absolutely amazing. And um, we've been getting a whole lot of comments also, also um, from the chat, you know, everybody saying what a fascinating talk. Um, I think it's uh, Stena saying, oh, what a fascinating talk, Prof. Um, uh, I think it's uh, Desire uh, saying, thank you, fascinating. Uh, introduction of our various and weird neighbors. Um, you know, just the comments have just been coming. Uh, Penny saying, what a wonderful world. Um, you know, absolutely, you know, thank you for broadening uh, my horizon. And I think uh, Penny speaks for all of us when she says, you know, you, you're broadening us so much in so many things. And Prof, I have a, a, just a quick question. Um, and as I ask you this question, let me ask everybody that's on the call, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, make sure to uh, leave them on the Q&A so that Prof can assist us with some of those answers. Um, if we are able to get to all of your wonderful questions, we will make sure that we post them on our Facebook page and ask Prof maybe to do a little comment uh, so that we can keep engaging and interacting about this wonderful and fascinating world that we're living in. Uh, Prof, um, you know, this is a, a question from a nine uh, from a non-scientist, non-conservationist, non, <laughs> just an individual who just loves uh, life. And we understand um, uh, the importance of, of conservation and biodiversity, everything working together. But that venomous snake that you spoke about um, found in the sea, I mean, do we really need such creatures <laughs> in the oceans? <laughs> the venomous, are you talking about the sea snake? Yes, the sea snakes. Yes. Prof. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, we've got to accept that we live in a world where there are predators and prey. And, uh, you know, predators are armed to catch prey and, 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 and prey are equipped through their behavior and uh, physiology to uh, avoid predation. And, you know, we are potentially prey uh, for, for some animals. And also when we enter their habitat, for instance, the ocean in the case of the sea snake, we're entering their homes and they have every right to protect themselves. Uh, you know, I think we have enough technology and intelligence to try and reduce the risk of uh, being harmed or bitten by um, venomous uh, and toxic wild animals. But, um, you know, they, they have every right to equip themselves to survive. And as I said at the beginning, we must recognize that every single species uh, of the eight to nine million species of animals known is a remarkable uh, survivor of a very tough test uh, through natural selection. And if I may comment, John, as far as I'm concerned, if you're curious and inquisitive, then you are a scientist. <laughs> oh, Prof, thank you for that. And um, I was looking at the poll there um, when, you asked, when you asked about, um, uh, you know, the different polls and the strangest animals that we've got. And you left out one animal. That is just, I think, the craziest animal and the craziest species on this planet is human beings. <laughs> I think human beings just go to the weirdest place and uh, find fascinating things like you've just shared with us now. So I found that very interesting, Prof. Well, I did, I did um, say at the beginning when I showed those, that picture of punk rockers in London, that I'm not going to include homo sapiens because we are very weird. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we are actually hold the future in our hands in terms of the survival of many of these other creatures that live on the planet. So I hope we'll live up to our name um, and be wise and have vision uh, because we've got a massive task ahead of us to uh, conserve biodiversity. Sure. Prof, um, uh, this presentation is something that you know, I feel like we need to just take it and just run a pile out of it and say, this is how beautiful the world is. Let's just love it, protect it, and uh, do our best to make sure that we conserve all the beautiful things. But Prof, let me just jump into the questions quickly. Uh, we've got quite a few, um, and let's see if we can get through them quite quickly. Mary saying, uh, Prof, um, thank you for the presentation. What is your respected opinion on the proposed aquatic um, a seismic um, survey, and I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, uh, properly. And uh, perhaps maybe let me take Alexander as well, and just so that you can uh, give us the two answers. Why does the manta, the, the manta ray have the flippers uh, by its mouth? <laughs> if you could take us through that, Prof. Okay, regarding the seismic surveys, obviously this being subject of a great deal of debate and um, commissions of inquiry and documentation lately. The only point I'd like to make is that many sea creatures have acute senses of hearing. We tend to regard sight as the uh, main um, sense organ because it's very strong in us. We have relatively poor sense of hearing and smell, but many marine animals uh, rely on, on, on hearing and the detection of vibrations um, in the sea. So they are super sensitive to these, much more so than we are. And I think we need to take that into account uh, when we assess the impact of uh, seismic survey. Uh, uh, an invertebrate or a fish or a mammal doesn't need to be right close to the seismic survey to be affected by it. Um, and as far as manta rays go, uh, yeah, that, that so-called um, cephalic horn. Uh, I think it's mainly uh, for directing prey into the mouth. Um, and and the, the very wide pectoral fins are what they use for swimming. Lovely. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up um, some, and thank you for that response, Prof. I'm picking up some really uh, fun, interesting questions here. <laughs> uh, some of those questions that feel like, you know, when you're at crunch level, you ask the questions, but those are the most fascinating questions. Um, um, I, so one of the questions is, does the lungfish actually have lungs? <laughs> yes. Yes, a lungfish does have lungs, uh, just like a sea snake uh, has a, a lung. And... Uh, so the lungfish is definitely able to um, breathe in air. And when they're in their cocoon uh, hibernating, they, they're breathing in air. And interestingly, uh, our African shark tooth catfish, it has um, gills uh, that it can absorb oxygen in the water, but it also has an air breathing organ, which is a modified gill in a chamber where it cap uh, goes to the surface, takes a gulp of air, and takes that air into that chamber so that it can breathe using the air breathing organ. So they have a kind of a hybrid system. And in Lake Ngami in Botswana, we have found catfish living in, in, in fluid mud where there's no water anymore, it's just fluid mud. And as long as they can keep the air breathing um, organ functioning, they're able to survive. Sure. So, you know, what we must remember when we talk about fishes, with 34,000 species, uh, there are some things that are normal for them, like breathing with gills and swimming with fins and so on, but there are exceptions to every rule. Awesome, Prof. Uh, let me just take two more questions uh, quickly as we wrapping up. Um, and I'll ask Belinda to also just um, put that slide up um, uh, about the books uh, so that we can just share with everybody that's still on the call. Um, and just the, the last two questions, um, um, why is the African clawed frog flat, uh, Prof? And uh, perhaps maybe if you can help us with Rainy's question as well. Um, and he's asking, um, why did you refer to certain soft underwater occupants as colonial, colonialists? 
<laughs> Very interesting questions. Yes, Prop. I don't quite get that question. What, what, firstly, what was the, uh, what was the first part of that question? So um, I think it's the second question that I asked. Um, why did you refer to certain soft underwater occupants as colonialists? I can't remember going back to the to the presentation. Uh, but I, I don't think, think I referred to any animal as colonialist. I might have called them colonial in that they live in colonies, but that oh. I'm not accusing them of being uh, Colonizing and <laughs> um, yeah, the the clawed frog, uh, clawed toad, uh, um, Xenopus or, or Platana, yeah, I mentioned that, and that's the one that the pregnancy test was done on, and it's also unusual in that its main method of moving around is swimming rather than hopping as an adult. Ah, got you, uh, Prof. Let me just take this last one quickly. Um, as we as we just about to wrap up, in fact, let me just take the last two. If everybody can just indulge me, um, are strange animals more robust or more vulnerable to environmental changes? And let me just take this last one as well, uh, uh, Prof. Can you elaborate on um, uh, cephalopods? Uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing that pro uh, properly. Uh, cephalopods uh, uh, brains and how they differ from mammalian brains? Yeah, it's difficult to generalize saying whether strange animals are more or less vulnerable to extinction than you know, the generalized population. It depends on each species. Um, some of them have many of the characteristics of animals that threaten with extinction and others don't. So, I, I, but I would say on the balance, that uh, these specialized strange animals are probably more vulnerable uh, because they often live in partnerships and they're part of um, complex communities. And the kind of things that we're doing to the ocean, the fresh water and on land are severely disrupting uh, the essential ecological processes and life support systems that allow those complex communities to survive. And you know what we're going to end up with uh, if we continue to uh, cause animals to go extinct is populations of generalized animals, the sort of animal equivalent of weeds uh, that are highly adaptable and can constantly respond to the changing environment. Whereas the more specialized animals that grew up in more stable ecosystems are, are the ones most vulnerable to extinction. So I would say on the balance of it, the strange animals are uh, more vulnerable. As far as cephalopods are concerned, you know, they are highly intelligent animals. Um, I remember working at the Two Oceans Aquarium, how we were totally baffled by how the octopuses got out of the aquaria that we kept them in, even though as far as we were concerned, they were completely sealed. Um, they can basically fit through a hole uh, that their eye can fit through. As long as the eye can fit through, they can fit through. So they have sophisticated brains, uh, differently developed from those of mammals, um, but still, com you know, compared with other invertebrates, they're highly intelligent. Oh, Prof, um, I don't know. It's a, it's just always such a pleasure to have you here. Um, you have, you know, you always take us on this amazing journey, and you make us see the world in a different light. It's like um, we finish this presentation now and. And as we walk out, I think we interact with, with life and, and the environment differently, just by the sheer massive um, complex uh, world that we're living in. And you know, with all its diverse creatures and, and all these wonderful animals that you've shared with us. So thank you for that, Prof. Um, well, I hope, to... John, that my talk encourages people to get out into the wild, uh, to crawl around on your stomach in the grass and the forest litter, looking at things duck your head into an intertidal pool and maybe dive um, offshore and just to take on board the extraordinary life uh, that we share the planet with. Uh, we shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, we have a responsibility to conserve it, but we can't conserve it unless we, we know about it and we are passionate about it. No, most definitely. And Prof, um, 
uh, and I intend to do exactly that. But the one thing that I'll probably do is if I see a fish climbing a tree, <laughs> I'll probably do something very bad to my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Prof, um, ladies and gentlemen, that's how we wrap it up today. It's been another fantastic um, uh, presentation and uh, something for us to marvel about. Um, the books that you've got on um, are all published by our friends from Random, uh, from Random House, uh, as well as Straight Nature. So please um, make sure that you check out the Straight Nature website page, as well as our Kirsten Bosch uh, Botanical Bookshop, uh, where these books are going to be available. So if you've been on this call today, you stand a chance to getting this amazing discount and making sure that you stock up on that bookshelf. Prof, thank you so much for your love, your passion. I think uh, your passion is something that allows us to, to want to live more. And, um, and it's because of individuals like yourself that makes us appreciate life even better. Um, we've been receiving amazing comments. In fact, the questions keep coming on. Um, so everybody that has um, you know, left a comment, Thank you very much. And uh, to some of the questions that you perhaps maybe didn't get to answer, we will show to send them through to Prof just so that he can make a comment. Uh, and then we'll post it on our Facebook page. So please go on, uh, go on ahead and like our Facebook page, Straight Nature Facebook page, as well as Kistenbosch National Botanical Facebook page. And we will search for Prof and see if he's got a Facebook page as well so that you can start following him on the socials. And uh, Prof, we need you on that socials and we need you to be active there. <laughs> Thanks, John, for your excellent chairing of the session. You've really brought the, the talk to life. Uh, thank you for your comments and thank you everyone for attending. Bye. Awesome. Everybody, thank you very much uh, from our team working behind the scenes. Thank you, Belinda and the team. Thank you um, to um, Kathy. Uh, Kathy, we absolutely love you for finding this amazing speakers uh, that uh, you know keep us on our toes every second Wednesday. Until we meet again next week, Wednesday, my name is John, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you guys on the call with all of us. So thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic week, and uh, see you guys next time. Cheers, Prof. Have a good one.